Well, good morning to all of you. Um, I've prepared a few things um, which uh, you might know. Those are models. But first of all, I would like to uh, do some groundwork and uh, um, concentrate on a uh, let's say on the basics. Um, what we have here, by the way, is a, a dragster bike which has been modeled completely in iron cat with uh, uh, the best materials available. So that's uh, about what I'm going to cover. And um, I will have, um, say, the first thing is uh, UI. We'll look into that. Um, we'll skip the modeling principle because uh, Richard outlined that quite well. For me personally, there are two things which are important in FEA. First of all, I can make um, unforeseen changes everywhere. So whatever someone requests in a change uh, scenario and wants to see alternates, it's all no problem. And I don't care whether it's uh, done in uh, IronCAD or whether it's just imported and I have to model, modify a geometry um, to model something um, as an add-on to the part or drill some holes. It is all easy to do and um, that's uh, the least problem I have. <coughs> Good. Um, let's start with the UI. We have this fluent ribbon bar. Um, this is a, a neat thing. Um, it uh, has some learning curve, but it, this is very low. Um, it learns the user's habits. So whatever you choose last turns up in an alternate selection. And you can um, arrange your um, system as you want. Um, you might uh, move all those uh, windows to other screens. And you might uh, add um, your own f favorite commands to the top line. So the next thing is I'm going to now um, look at the maneuvering in the scene. That's the first thing we have to make sure that everyone understands and is able to use. To. So let's go to the NEI um, screen. Now. Let me move that down. OK. So first of all, we open um, an empty um, scene. We can do that either by clicking on New, then we can select whatever we want to start, or we can um, just say New Scene Using Default Template. You might want to have your own template. As you've seen now, we do have our own owns. And whenever we create a picture, our IronCAD 4D, in this case, turns up or speedy engineering if you need it. Then we do have uh, a number of uh, chapters, um, features, sketch, surface, and so on. You will be most of the time on the feature. Um, this is all on modeling. Then you will have a model tree of NEI Nastran, and you will have a scene and properties area for the modeling. If you click on this icon here, you can um, hide it. So it slowly moves to the uh, left and a little bit faster with IronCAD. And now you can um, switch on whatever you need for the current phase. So if you're modeling, you would like to have the scene active. And if you're doing your um, analysis, you might want to see um, your Nastran stuff instead. OK, so um, what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to point out a little bit which, um, oh, where, where am OK, sorry, which um, basic buttons we need to uh, move in the scene. That's I'm going to pull in some uh, building block. That's basically how IronCAD works. You have a number of things in catalogs, and you can um, pull them in, and it doesn't play any role what it is. It might be a, a shape, or it might be a color. It might be a texture, whatever you need to um, get your model up and running is in catalogs. OK, first thing and the most important one is if you have lost track of your model, you want to refine it again. Um, you can click on Fit Screen or use F8. And there is a shortcut as well, which I really um, find useful. It's uh, I'll move it away again. It's a double click on the middle mouse wheel. If you double click, it's there again. This double click is not supported yet by the um, any Nastran part 
but um, I think this is one of the uh, um, improvements which we are going to face in the next month. The next thing is you have to um, move in the scene. First thing is um, zooming. Usually you have a mouse wheel and you zoom in with steps. You usually zoom into the point where the cursor is. If uh, the cursor is in the middle of the part and you zoom back and forth and keep it there, it's moving into the middle. If the cursor is outside of the part and you move um, or scroll, it moves out. So you can um, easily move a little bit in the scene with just uh, scrolling in and out. The same thing as a uh, fine-tuned is uh, same middle mouse wheel. If you press it and press the control button, you have a fine movement. Um, the next thing you want to do is you want to pan in the scene. That is done either by the pan command, F2. You see the cursor is changing now. Okay, and you might do the same with always the middle mouse button and the shift key. I'm pressing the shift key now and that works fast. So um, what I do have now is scrolling the mouse wheel. I do have uh, control for fine movements and I do have a shift key from um, shifting the part around in the scene. What we really do here is we're um, camera people. We're standing behind a camera. We're looking through a camera and not the part is moving so the origin always stays um, the same. But um, we are moving with our camera around the part if we rotate and uh, so it's a little bit of a, um, a basic understanding thing you gotta do um, because it eases your work if you want to do nice pictures but um, this is something for the next lesson I guess. Okay, um, one thing I have not addressed yet if I just press down the middle mouse button I can rotate. Rotation is here available as, as well. It's F3 orbit. So you can do all these things with the middle mouse button and I find that very uh, agreeable. So let's go to the next buttons here. We do have a look at and a target. Those are used quite often. The look at F7 is um, a point which I click at and this point is now the new middle in the scene. So whenever I click on something, maybe let's move it over there. I say F7 and click on this point. Then this point will be the middle, the focus of the camera, camera after the click. And it turns into this um, side. So I, it's very easy to look at parts from on, onto different surfaces. You might do that as well by selecting one of the basic views like front, top, left, right and so on um, but I find it easier just to use this F7 and uh, that's one of my favorites. You might want to do the same without, uh, without turning the part as well. You can do that by using the target command control F7 so if you click at that this is the new middle and it's the new rotation point as well. So if I rotate, it rotates around this middle. If I do it again onto another point, this is the new rotation center. Okay, so that is an easy way to focus onto small parts of something of a large assembly. Uh, if you want to work and change something on this assembly at this point, um, it does two steps in one. Okay, we've done that, we've done those base views, now we have to look on the next buttons on the um, base, there is a camera button, let's see what that does, a few commands, the most important one is undo camera, if you do this, and this is something which the fluent ribbon bar does now, it sorts this command to the front, so you have the undo button now and you can use it by one mouse click. You go back to all the views we had in the past. So you always can easily switch back to a certain view which you used and you might as well um, go forth as well. There's a redo camera which now allows you to go back to your latest view you've, used, you've chosen, you've used. 
Next thing is uh, perspective. Perspective is something which I usually only use if I create nice pics. Um, it doesn't make much sense to use it while you design. Perspective is on right now. You see that uh, the lines are no longer parallel. If I switch it off, it looks a bit strange, but it's still um, an easy way to do things because now all the lines um, are um, on same height. And even if I look through the part, I might do that with the next command. I use the wireframe command. You see that it's all clean. If I now switch to perspective, I see this perspective, and I usually can see which line I'm looking at if I need some reference. So this is uh, shaded with edges. That's a common thing. Shaded is looking a little bit nicer. So if you want to do a quick pick um, or some documentation or you want to downscale the picture, um, it's better to switch off the edges. It looks a little bit more um, nicely. You might use the wireframe. You then see everything. And you might as well use wireframe with hidden edges so you can determine what's on the front and what's on the back. And you might as well use wireframe edges removed. But I don't see much sense in that, so I don't use it quite often. The wireframe, the shaded, shaded with edges are my favorite commands. OK, now we are able to move in the scene. We have our basic commands. What is important uh, to know um, that all those uh, settings we have here, with exception of the ones which you reach over the menu button, those ones, um, are saved in the scene itself. The scene template is nothing than an empty scene. So there's just no part in it, but all the other settings are in it. And the settings which are for us important, I think in Europe, if we use American examples, are that we have to switch to different units. We can do that um, by going, going to common and then to units. And if I open one of the models uh, from NEI, I usually see the, the American pretty units like uh, inches or feet or uh, pounds. And uh, if you switch to um, European units, the part will maintain its size. Just the units will be changed. Uh, something which is one inch long now becomes 25.4 millimeters. Uh, so um, it's always keeping the stuff. If you want to see what it does, you have units here, millimeters and degree. So you can see we're on the right unit system for, say, European purposes, most of them. OK, so now let's look a little bit under, um, to structure, selection, and visibility. I right now do have here one part in my scene. I see it in the um, feature tree, or structure tree, or I think it's scene browser in IronCAD. I'm always used um, to the German terms, so um, I sometimes try to um, translate them back into English, and that doesn't always work well. Um, what we do have here now is one part, and there's one IntelliShape shape in it. This is something special. Um, I usually compare them uh, with atoms and molecules. So this is an atom. It's uh, um, the case where one molecule only contains one atom. Usually I add more atoms, like a cylinder, or like, uh, let's say, a hollow sphere and a hollow slab, whatever I add. And then I have several intelli shapes, which make up one part. Um, so this is the base level. What's behind one of those intelli shapes? There's some uh, cooking recipe behind. Um, we have the chance to um, edit a cross section. I can edit this cross section. In this case, it's just a rectangle. Um, I might move one of the corner points. Let's say finish. It has changed its shape. But still, we have preserved the intelligence. So it is still an intelligent body. It has a number of additional commands. And I might just um, pull on one of those handles and it's resizing. I can't, um, I can control the um, way how this angle now is changed. I might introduce some uh, um, command like, uh, in this case, a, say, a angle constraint. Use one of those and set this to a constant value. Let's edit it and let's set it to exactly, let's say, 66. 
about 6 or 6 degrees. And now you see it's changing. And if I do pull the handle now, I get a different resizing behavior. The angle stays as is, but something else moves. So with those constraints in the sketch, you can control the behavior. Usually we don't use many constraints. In general, in IronKit, we only use constraints in the moment where we um, express some design intent, where we document design intent. So in this uh, dynamic and free modeling in IronCAD, um, you have only a uh, very sh um, small number of uh, constraints, but all of those have a meaning. A designer has uh, intended something, and you can um, explicitly document by using them how you want uh, a model to behave. As an example, you might take two blocks, and they always shall be 10 millimeters apart, um, so you can um, invent a constraint, um, distance constraint with 10 millimeters, and then if one part mo moves, the other part will move along, and the distance will always be kept uh, constant. Yeah, maybe because um, you want to uh, something to dive into this um, hollow area. So this is a basic concept on the, on the um, let's see lowest levels, and now we go to, uh, let, let me use that one, okay, let me pull in some, some parts, okay, a cylinder pyramid, let's say a block, a pyramid, another block, another pyramid, okay, so now we have a few parts in the scene, and now you see all those parts are um, on the same level, on top level of the scene. We now can um, select parts by just clicking on them. I might select this one and with the shift key I'm adding this one, this one and this one. I might, might as well add them by um, using the control key um, as you do in the file explorer in the scene browser. So we have selected now this number of parts and if I go to assembly I can say assemble. Now I create an assembly. This is different from the usual um, type of uh, strongly parametric modelers. We have to um, have your planning done up front before you do the first part. We always can change these things. Um, this is just a uh, mean, means of ordering the parts in the um, structure tree. Let me do it this way here. Those two, we can assemble them again. Now I've created some tree. As a top assembly and a sub assembly and some parts. And now I might even move out parts. So I use those two, for example. I might want to move them out. I let them drop in the scene. Now they're on scene level again. I can create a uh, assembly again. And I might as well move the assembly. I let it drop in here. And now it's here, here again. You might want to reorder. If you do that, you just pull up, and then you see that the curve is changing to two um, parallel lines. Now you sort in. If you move up and it changes to a plus sign, you move the part from one assembly to another. You're changing the order. So you have absolute freedom to organize your model. You can change it anytime. You can do it differently for an explosion view, and you even can maintain several of those organizations in parallel by using um, this configuration feature. Okay, now let's look into um, the certain ways how to select parts. I have selected those by clicking onto the parts, and we can do that as well by just um, opening a rectangle from left to right. Left to right just includes what's fully in the selection rectangle. So the green and yellow part won't be included. If I do likewise from right to left, I will have those included as well which are touched by the um, rectangular selection frame. Okay, those, those are all yellow, no, they're, they're selected. This is one way to select a uh, number of parts. And it doesn't um, matter, you can uh, select a combination of uh, assemblies and parts. Now let's see how we click down. 
If I click onto this assembly the first time, I see that the assembly on the top level is selected. If I click on it a second time, I see that it moves down one level deeper. If I click again, it moves to the part level. If I click again, it moves to the IntelliShape level. Let me open that. I see the IntelliShape. And uh, as I know what's happening now, I click again. IntelliShape. And now I see the face level. This might be a face, a face, a surface. It might be an edge. You see the cursor shape is changing, or it might be a point. And you can apply certain things to uh, faces, edges, or points. Um, you might, for example, um, want to apply a uh, chamfer to an edge. You can do that by just clicking on the edge. Okay, now let's show you some shortcuts. Um, usually it's a bit cumbersome, especially if we have a very deep structure, to um, click on those um, parts. Let me select all of those. Um, and assemble again. Now we have certain levels. We have one, two, three levels, four levels here. If I want to reach this uh, brick, for example, I will have to click four times. There is a shorter way to do that. Click on it with the left mouse and the key control pressed. You're immediately on part level. Same is possible for the IntelliShape level. You click on a part with Alt key pressed. Now you're on the IntelliShape level. And if something is wrong with the selection, just click outside and do it again. Same I would apply to parts which don't behave well, which do not do what, what you've intended to things which are positioned wrongly, like in, in uh, let's say, you've selected the wrong part, you, you put it on there, but you meant to uh, apply it to some other part, just delete it and redo it. That's the fastest way to do things. Because you, you don't have to pay for these things. Um, you don't have a number of constraints which you have to remove or repair. You don't sit there for half an hour to clean up stuff. You just do it. Okay. Now, let me th go through these. Um, you're going to get this PowerPoint if you want. Um, um, I'm sure Scott will make sure that you get them. We've done all those. And we've done all those. But what I haven't done, I haven't shown you how to make parts visible or invisible and how to um, deactivate them and activate them. If there is a large scene, you usually want to concentrate on a single part to modify it, or two parts, let's say. We want to do something with those two parts. Then I've clicked onto those two parts with the Shift key, and you see now the selection is possible even between different levels of um, depth in the assemblies. Right mouse, while I'm on those parts, I always get a context menu in Iron Cat everywhere, and the context menu always offers me what I usually um, need. Uh, so now say no, height selected or height unselected, and I'm there. This is just yeah, show all. This is just some something easy to make things um, better visible. The other thing you can do, you can click on a part or assembly or whatever combination you have. You can say a right mouse. Same is possible here. You get the same type of context menu, and you can suppress. Suppress means that it's now out of the game, um, partially, and might be unloaded later on from um, so that it frees memory. It is just there. You see, um, if you click on the part um, where it's sitting, but that's all what is there. It's no longer turning up in the bill of materials, um, and that allows you to um, not to delete stuff which you don't use any longer, but just to uh, make sure that's no longer in the game and no longer meshed and no longer accessed. Okay, I'm through with that. Now let's go to the models. The first one is uh, a special one for Francesco. Um, let me just uh, open up a new scene. I'm going to close this one because I don't need it any longer. I click on the second one, new scene using default template now. Okay, and then I pull in a block. 
That's the simplest model you can do. Um, you might give it a name, and it turns up uh, everywhere else in the documentation. Um, let me call it block. It's not even a name, but okay. So now let's uh, shell out this block so that it gets hollow. Context menu shows you what you can do. Shell command. And now we have to select what we want to do. It usually starts with open faces, but in this case we want to get the affected body selected. This is this body. And we don't want to define any open faces, so we leave it as is. I set the thickness to 6 millimeters. And if we want to see what we've done, we always can press on the glasses. I see there is something shelled out in the middle. And that's what we want. Um, if you want to see how that uh, um, works, you might um, go to the sorry tools menu. You might uh, want to section a part. You say, I want to define the section plane. Click on it. And now you see it's really hollow. Let's delete the section tool again. So that's what we need. And now let's go to uh, NEI. Um, what I usually do um, at this point, um, I say switch on so that it's stay staying there. I switch this one off. I always can invoke it now if I need it. Okay, the first thing I want to do is I want to apply some loads, new loads. And uh, now I can click on outer faces, but what I want to do, I want to select the inner faces. There's a filter here on the right bottom corner. If I just select faces, I say box select, I've got all those. With the shift key now, I can deselect whatever I don't need because I can't select into the part itself, but now I've selected all the faces. You see, it starts with 7 and ends with 12. Um, what we now need is some pressure, some value of N1 Newton, and uh, we've now done what we need. We need a constraint. Let's fix it somewhere. Okay. Next thing we will need is some physical properties. Solid elements is good. And we need some material. Let's load uh, the first material, some steel. Now we're done. We would need now to update the meshes to see that we have a suitable mesh. And I would want like to, would like to solve that in Nastran. And it w wants to save the whole thing one time first, which is acceptable. And now I'll let it run. Um, these are all things which are not easily findable, but uh, to create a part with a hollow part. Uh, with some pressure applied inside is a little bit difficult to imagine, but it's good for testing. Okay. Let's take a second or two. Uh, the next models I'm going to address are just models. Um, let's look into that one. Deform contour. So we look at it now and um, I've switched on off something, contour, that's some um, transparent stuff inside. I don't know how I got it. Didn't turn up in the morning, but um, it is there. And the whole model works. Good. Um, next model, let me go into this one, is a bracket. There are the dim dimensions. Um, but if you want to, I can do a small video so that you can uh, um, practice how to deal with that model, how to create it. Let's close this one. We'll open up a new scene. Okay. Again, I'm going to pull in a mo uh, block with the left um, mouse button. Now I have to change the size. I click on it one time for selecting the part, another time for selecting the IntelliShape level. I might do that with pressing Alt key immediately. Now I can just pull on those and I can double click on such a value to set it to a certain value, 150. And always the, the yellow one will, mu will move, um, the selected one. Um, the thing is they have to be identical in selection. So both of them have to be yellow to move symmetrically. 
I've done that for the second one with control key, 50. Or both of them have to um, be not selected. And if you want to know what you're doing, you can move over with the cursor and you see an H for height, a width, and here we do have an alpha length. So what we want to change is height. And I'll go on to right mouse, edit size box, and this is where I can do all three at once. I want to change the height, and it's done now symmetrically. Okay. This is our base model. Next thing we want to do is we want to apply a chamfer. I click on the edge. Now the sand is distance, so it's on the same value on both sides. You might add the value here, but I usually do it here. What I want to have, what I want to have is distance and angle. Um, you can toggle the value to determine the direction. Sometimes it comes up in the right direction, sometimes not. It depends which one you click at. Um, how it's oriented towards the X, Y, and Z axis. So this is the right way to do it. And uh, I do want to have 100 millimeters here. The 23 degree angle is okay. And with glasses, I'll, I usually get the preview. I'll say, okay, that's it. Next thing I want to do is I want to um, get a shell part. So now I have to um, select the body or directly the open faces because if that's my, the body I touch, um, it goes to open faces and enters the value. I can add a thickness here, maybe five millimeters in this case because we had six before. And I say this I want to have open, this one and this one as well. I might now select other faces which I want to have individually um, shelled, but that's okay for this model. Okay, so next thing we have to do, we have to add some holes. Um, you can add um, with a tools catalog um, all the, the regular stuff, that's all the standard parts system, the custom holes. But what I usually do, I don't change the catalog, I stay here and say hollow cylinder, and now it adds a cylinder. I go into one of those handles and say edit size box. Now we want to have a diameter of 12.5 millimeters and we don't care about the height. Those two length and width are coupled so when I leave the field with uh, the tab key for example, the other field is copied as automatically so that the cylinder stays round. Now we need the same on the bottom and now I have a little trick. Um, I want to make sure that it's sitting on a, on a definite point. And uh, I'll do it wrong now first. I'll let, first of all, I zoom in. That is a trick to um, reduce the size of the part which you um, fetch in. If I do it now, I see there, there's a point in the middle. And if I let it drop onto this point, it is exact in the middle. Now I get a, um, some dialog which asks me for the size. I want to have 12.5 millimeters automatically and say, OK. But that's the wrong direction. That depends on the view. If I look more on this face than on this face, like in this case, it is oriented away from me. It's always oriented away from me. So to make sure that the hole um, is drilled down, I have to look more into this face. I do the same again. Let it drop and make sure you hit this um, middle point. I say again 12 and 5. And uh, now we get something very um, beautiful. It is a bit difficult to learn because it's, um, it's doing everything. It uh, is able to feed cows and uh, to walk your dog and uh, educate your children. It's tribal. It does everything. Um, in this case, we just want to move. So I pull on this handle. I constrain temporarily the movement along this axis. And I've done that with the right mouse button. And with the right mouse button, I always get a context menu. Now I can select what do I want to do. I just want to move. I want to move it 20 millimeters, and it's done. I do the same again, and now I want to link. Copy creates individual objects, and link creates brothers and sisters. They're all alike in this case, um, and if I change one of them, 
the others change as well. The only thing they have not in common is the position in space. So what I've done now, I forgot about uh, changing the number. I did only one copy. So what I do is now undo. I redo this. Sorry. Pull again. Link here and say I want to have two with 25 millimeters. So now this model is done. I think it should be more, a bit more, but um, I don't mind. I think I've used uh, too long of a size here. In reality, it's just 120 millimeters, and now we see the um, beautiful thing in IronCAD. Uh, without having set up any constraints or anything, we can go to the scene, here in this case, and change the size of the block. I right mouse, pull it here, or I can double click it here and I say 120 millimeters and everything is now our original model like we used to see it from the Iron Cat. This is the first model. I'm going to close now this and open up a new scene. And let's go to the next model, the spike frame. Find a very easy one. Um, and it's uh, talking to a lot of people because um, there are a lot of people who like bikes. First one is 36 millimeters in diameter. Double click. And here the H shall be, let's say, 100 millimeters or 130 or so. Okay. Now we have to add the next one. To make sure that the cylinder is really starting in the middle, I could just move it anywhere here, and, but the thing is I can pull it now. It's always um, tangential, and um, it will, but it will not, for example, move into the X direction. In this case, I would have to use the tri ball and make it sure that it looks into um, some clear direction, like X. Okay, and now it's no longer pointing towards the middle. So next thing I would have to do, uh, make sure that it's just moving along this axis and I go to the middle point and say to center point. Now it's in the pointing to the middle again but it's now exactly pointing towards X. This is a little bit too long for me. There are always many ways to do it in IronCAD. There's um, usually three, four, five ways. And uh, one is the one you like um, and one is the one I like. I like to do it this way. I put it on top, and then that's now do both values in one. Um, it's a little bit smaller, 30 millimeters. It does a, have a length of 250. And I use the tri ball and just tilt it by 90 degrees. Okay, I've used the right mouse in the free area here, not where the special meanings are, like for this face or so, or these handles, here in the free area. And now just move it down. Right mouse again. Move just 30 millimeters. Now we need a second one. I move again. Sorry. My fault. I want to copy it. One with 60 millimeters. You see I'm always moving it to um, roughly the point where I need it. And I can see what the value is and check it with the thing I have in mind. Now we have to move our attention to the second one. Use the tribal again. This is tribal positioning tool, F10. And I usually use F10. Then uh, this is our constraint, our temporary constraint. It shall move around this axis. I go with the curve in the free area. Right mouse button. Keep it pressed so that I get a context menu. Leave it. Move it by 10 degrees. So near, we're now re nearly ready. Next thing I have to, got to do is I have to blend the edges. And um, full constant blend is okay. You see there's a number of other things. Um, so you can get every blend working. Iron can, can do um, um, blends with uh, zero degree um, and zero diameter, which is uh, not common for every program, and can do it with um, extremely high values as well. So that's